From the cross to the grave to the empty tomb. Happy Easter. The Lord is risen. Let's stand together and sing our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. to worship. Great to be together on this Easter morning. Special welcome to all of our visitors and guests. It's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, please uh, drop by the welcoming table. It's just at the back of the church following worship. Uh, no coffee today because we know that you want to get home and have your turkey and your coffee and your friends and family stuff. So uh, we'll continue that next week as well. Once again, great to be together on this very wonderful day we call Easter. We continue with our service as we stand together. As we stand together. <laughs> Maybe I'll use the Trinity. As we stand together. <laughs> Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
pray together. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we invite your presence into our worship this morning and consecrate this time to you. Be glorified in the preaching, in the singing, our praying, and our meditation on your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus to forgive the iniquity of our sin. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known from you. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God. Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let's pray together. O oh God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, and by his glorious resurrection you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, so that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite all the children forward for the children's story. Pastor Bart will be sharing that with you this morning. Is there a mic there? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. How are you today? So here's an easy question. What day are we celebrating today? Easter. Easter, yes. And what happened on the first Easter so long ago that is so important that we have to celebrate it? Yeah. Jesus rose from the dead, right. And the, the great thing about that message is that anybody who connects himself with Jesus, who says, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. I want to be part of your covenant. I want to be part, I want to have that connection with you. We can have that happen with us too. That's the whole point of Easter. That's the ma huge message. So we don't have to be worried about death. That's great, yeah. Okay, here's another question. Where do we learn about that story? The story of Easter and Jesus rising from the dead. Where do we hear it from? Yes. Church, yeah. And how does the church know about it? Yes. The Bible, yeah. So I got a Bible here. Yeah. So we learn about the story in the Bible. But you know, um, Martin Luther said something really interesting. He said, he said, you can't, if you, if you look at the world outside, if you look at nature, you can learn something about God. You can learn some stuff about God. What do you think you can learn about God from nature? I think God is, what would you learn from God, about God from nature? Yeah. What he created, what he created. yeah. And is, does it look beautiful? Yeah. yeah. So that tells you God's an artist. Yeah. What else can, oh, sorry, I stole your, <laughs> I stole your answer. What else can you learn from, about God from nature? Yeah. I like that answer. I think what you're, what you're trying to say is that it isn't, it, it's beautiful and interesting, but it's not always sweet, right? It's, it's powerful, you know, but powerful and beautiful, not always sweet. Um, you know, Luther would say, you can learn a bit about God from nature, but you can't learn, do you think you can learn that God loves us from nature? Not really, not really. You, need, you see that God is powerful, you see he's majestic, you see he's an artist, but to learn that God loves us, where do you need to look? Yeah. The Bible, the Bible right. The Bible tells the story about Jesus dying on the cross, and that makes sense. But once you understand the Bible, then the cool thing is you can see stuff, other messages in the world outside, in nature, that remind us of the Bible. Remind us of the Bible. So here's, here's one that people talk about a lot. What have I got here? Yeah. Butterfly. A butterfly. Yeah. Where do butterflies come from? Yeah. Caterpillars, right. Caterpillars, you know, they, they do their thing. They live as caterpillars. And then at one point, they kind of wrap themselves up in this, what we call a cocoon. And it looks almost like they're dead, you know? And then when they come out from that, they look a lot nicer than they did as caterpillars, I think. And I mean, caterpillars are cute, you know, as long as there are not too many of them. But <laughs> caterpillars turn into butterflies. There's, it's beautiful. Um, Luther would say, God also wrote the promise of the resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. And I brought, I brought an illustration of that. <laughs> this plant I had uh, looked like it died, as you can tell. Then, then there is new life that came. And, and God does that in the world outside, that each winter it looks like things die and they come back to life. Now, you can't learn from that that God loves us. But once you understand the Bible, you understand nature a little bit better too. And you see God has put his reminders of Easter everywhere. So can we pray together? Gracious God, Gracious God. we thank you that you love us so much. We thank you that you love us so much. We thank you for Easter. Thank you for Easter. Thank you that you rose from the dead. We thank you that you rose from the dead. And that you promise us. And that you promise us. That anyone who connects to you. That anyone who connects to you. Can also rise from the dead. Can also rise from the dead. Help us trust and believe in you always. Help us trust and believe in you always. To hear the message of the Bible. To hear the message of the Bible. And see places. And see places. In your world. In your world. That remind us of the Bible. That remind us of the Bible. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. You can go back to your seats.
The first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. The psalm today is Psalm 16. We can read it together. Um, if this side of the church, the east side of the church, will read the odd verses, and the west side will read the even verses. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have done no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, for take the names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary line has fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to show, or let your faithful one see the pit. There's fullness of joy in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Here ends the readings.
The Holy Gospel is from the 20th chapter of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw, that the strips, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had yet to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please remain standing for the hymn, Thine is the Glory.
Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate Easter. We thank you for the messages of Easter and how it matters so much to us. And we ask that you'd come with your Holy Spirit and touch each of us right now so we can hear from you and hear what you have to say, however you choose to say it, from the scriptures, from the hymn, from conversation with friends, from the message. Lord, we ask that we would hear from you today in Jesus' name. Amen. So Easter is a, is a festival with a lot of different sides to it, and, um, and it also follows an, a series of festivals, or a series of events. The, the last week of Jesus' life had, had lots of stuff going on. And, but of course, the most important message of Easter is something I mentioned in the kids' message, that Jesus' death on the cross paid for our sins, and his sacrifice, if we accept the offer he gives us, the free offer, um, just, just believe that he's Savior. Accept him as your Savior. For, ask forgiveness for anything you haven't, you've done that you shouldn't have done. Ask him to help you do better. And that's it. That's, that's, he, you, can be, you can be part of his covenant. He can be your Savior, and that gives you salvation. And so we ask at Easter time to remember that, and we ask for the ability to stay within God's covenant and to keep taking Jesus as Savior and Lord for the rest of our lives. And all of this gives us hope because... As uh, someone has said, the worst thing that can happen to anybody is death. But Easter shows us that God is more powerful than death. And he gives that same gift to anyone who follows him. We had a visiting pastor here three weeks ago. His name was Leif Camp. And he, he summed it up pretty well. He said that the message of the gospel and Easter really is, you know, Jesus has already paid for all of your sins on the cross already. What part of that would you not actually want? That's, this is a free offer we get. It's, uh, you, it's, it's in our interest to take hold of it and accept Jesus as Savior. It's a good deal. And so that part of the Easter message is uh, something about our connection with God and, and forecast what's going to happen to us um, in heaven in the next life. But there's lots of parts of the Easter message and of the events that took place before Easter that speak to us about God's plans for us now and for this world now. And those are really good to focus on as well. So we're going to look at that today, and we're going to look a little bit at the tail end of Psalm 16, which is our psalm for today, and how that reminds us of some of these messages of Easter. So let's recap quick some of what happened to Jesus before Easter happened. He, uh, a week before Easter on Palm Sunday, he rode into Jerusalem and was proclaimed as king. And that's really interesting because most of the time Jesus was pretty quiet about his ministry as much as he could be. He'd hide away, he'd go to out-of-the-way places. He told people not to announce that they'd been healed miraculously. He told them usually not to say anything to anybody. He was trying to stay quiet as much as he could. He couldn't really succeed all that much, but he tried to. On Palm Sunday, he changed up his approach and he was very public and he, he made a splash, he deliberately made a splash so that people would proclaim him as king. And that shows us God's vision, God's blueprint, blueprint for the world. That Jesus is going to be king of the world and when God's plans unfold, he will take up rulership of this world. And that's good news. When Jesus takes over, there will be no more war, no more injustice, no more poverty, no more troubles at work. Those politicians you'd like to grumble about, some of them will be forced to retire. Good news for you folks. No more, no more war in Palestine, no more war in Ukraine. It's all taken care of. So we look forward to that. That is God's promise to us. When he comes back, that's what's going to happen. Palm Sunday tells us, gives us the blueprint, the future vision. On Good Friday as well, something also really significant happened that tells us something very powerful. If, you've, if you read the story in the Bible about Good Friday, it says that when Jesus died on the cross, the very moment he died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. What was that about? That's really interesting. Because what it, what it says is this. The Jewish people, of course, had a temple, and there was a special room in the temple called the Holy of Holies. And it was in that room where God lived, they thought. That was where God's presence was. And nobody would go in that room. And there was a huge curtain, thick curtain, that separated that room from, from the rest of the temple and from everybody and from the rest of the world. The only person that would go into that room was the high priest and once a year. 
And it was kind of a scary experience for him when he went in there. The, the, the people, of, the Israelites thought that, um, you know, God is good, but he's a bit dangerous, kind of almost like electricity. You know, it's good, but it's got to be careful around it. It's, it's a bit dangerous. And so they, the story went, they'd tie a rope to the guy's ankle that it would have to go in there and have bells for him to ring. And so if he passed out or fell over or something happened in that room, the guys on the outside could pull on the rope and get him out, right? So that's their view of, of God, good but dangerous. And, and not for everybody, just the high priest once a year. But when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain that separated God from the rest of the world, symbolically, split apart. What does that mean? It means a couple things. It means, and St. Paul talks about this in the rest of the Bible, that you know, we have the Holy Spirit in our lives that means each of us become a temple, miniature temple. Um, the temple is where God's presence is, and if God's presence is now with his people, each of us individually, then each of us become temples. You know, I'm looking at approximately 200 temples out there today, miniature temples. God is with us. And it also means, in another sense, there's nothing separating God from the rest of the world. So the world becomes God's temple, which is also good news. This is God's plan for humanity for, for the long term. He wants to turn the world into Eden, into paradise again. That's good news also. And of course, the, the message of Easter, we talked about that with, uh, with the children this morning. When Jesus rose from the grave, it's not just about him, and it's not just about something that happened a, a long time ago. It again is a blueprint for God's plan for the people who follow him. It says, just as it happened with Jesus, it's going to happen with you. That's, after all, why Jesus went through it all. And that's why he came back and showed his new body to the disciples. So he could say, you know, it happened to me, it can happen to you. Just follow me. Take me as Savior and Lord. This is God's guarantee for you. That's not a bad deal. We can beat death also if we connect to Jesus. There's one last event that we uh, celebrate often uh, during this past week, and we, we look at the Last Supper, and we had a special service on Thursday night that, that commemorates that. I'm going to recap a tiny bit of what I said there. The Last Supper, of course, that was, um, is a Passover meal, as you know. Jesus had his Passover meal with his disciples. And as you know, the first Passover, what the Israelites celebrated, well, didn't celebrate at that point, but they went through in Egypt, the very first one, they had to paint on the doorposts of their houses the blood of the lamb, and the reason for doing that is so that the angel of death would pass over the houses that were painted like that and not hurt the people inside. So this is what Jesus is remembering with his disciples, and on the night when he's, they're celebrating this and he's thinking about this, he goes and he takes a communion cup and he says, you know, I'm the lamb of God, and you know something? This is my blood. I'm the Lamb of God, and this is my blood, right? And, he's, and he shows it to them. And so the message, they get it right away. The message is, just as happened with the disciples, or with the, the Israelites in Egypt, painting the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of their houses kept them safe from the angel of death. Jesus says, this is my blood that keeps you safe, those of you who connect with me from eternal death, right? And... Um, the, it's, it's interesting what he does as well. It's, you know, the, the Israelites, they could paint the blood on their doorposts of their houses. It's, it's, of course, close to them, but external. It's something outside of them. But when we have communion, we're taking into our bodies, right? It's like we're painting our physical selves with this protection that Jesus offers us. So it's, uh, it's an awesome statement. And so in that, God is saying, I want to connect with you. I want to connect with you personally. And there's lots of other parts of scripture that give that same message. Jeremiah 31, I'm going to write my law and my covenant on your hearts, says God. You know, in the New Testament later on, it talks a lot about giving the Holy Spirit into us, right? Um, the curtain being torn in the temple, God wants to be with us. So part of the message of Holy Week, of what led up to Easter, is God wants to be with us. Well, we might say, okay, that's nice, but what does that mean? What does that really mean? And I think that's where Psalm 16 can be helpful because it tells us, it kind of spells out for us the implications, what it means for each of us to have that deep connection with God and how that's relevant for us now. Not just in heaven, 
not just 10 years from now, but now. And Psalm 16 is really interesting. If you look at the message, it, it basically has, has three messages. It says, who is God? God is God, obviously, but what is a God? A God is the person who gives you good things, things that are good. That is, that's tough for us to swallow sometimes because, um, you know, ever since Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve messed up there, every human is a little bit distrustful of God. We, we kind of, we want to take the driver's seat away from God because we think that if we're in the driver's seat, life is going to go better for us than if God's in the driver's seat, right? It's our instinctive nature, and it doesn't end when you become a Christian, when you get saved. It doesn't end when you become a pastor either. It doesn't end when you become a church leader. We all have that. We've got to battle with that through our whole lives, and gradually we learn to trust God, that God is good, right? It takes a while sometimes, um, and, and we never fully overcome that distrust, but we, we ask for God's help to do so. But it says God is good. That's what the psalm says. The other thing it says, if God is good and he's the giver of all good things, which it also says, then even having God in our lives, the giver of all good things, is worth it. That itself is a gift, right? Uh, I think it's verse 8 that says, I keep the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I won't be moved. Won't be moved. And then the last statement is that if God is in our lives and the giver of all good things, that means we can hope for good things in the future, not just in heaven, although certainly we'll get good things there, but in this life too. And, um, you know, the Psalms are interesting. Luther would say, we're, we're supposed to read the Psalms as if they're words written for each Christian. Each Christian person is supposed to say, that's for me. Those are words written for me. And L Luther gave an example from his own life. He said... Uh, you know, people tried to kill me, and they also, the, the medieval church at the time said, I can't have communion anymore, but you know, I'm still alive, and, and I've had communion in my church in Wittenberg every Sunday since then, right? And everybody knows it. And he says, and you know, so the Psalm 23 applies to my life. God got me through the valley of the shadow of death, and he's literally prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies, a communion table, and they know it. They know it. Psalm 23 applies to me. And so he says, just in the same way, the Psalms apply to you. Somebody uh, pointed this out to me at uh, one point uh, with this Psalm. And so I'm going to tell you this story. It's a personal story. But the reason for sharing it is, is it again illustrates how we're supposed to use the Psalms. And it again says, okay, there's a message here, which is for you, for you. So uh, back half a lifetime ago, I was a university student, and, and uh, um, I moved from one town to the next. And when I, when I uh, moved, I left behind a bunch of friends in the old place. And I was missing some of, uh, you know, some of those old connections and you know, wonder what's going to happen in the future. And feeling a little lost, I'd moved to Toronto. It was a big city. Feeling a little lost in the big crowd. So I thought, OK, I'm going to go meet some people. Where should I do that? I'll go to church, right? And I'll, I'll choose a big church where lots of people go. Makes sense, it seemed. So I went to an evening service there. I was new in the place, hadn't been there before. And again, all this thoughts about I'm kind of missing the old life a little bit were going through my mind. And, and I got to the, the church and I discovered that they'd canceled the evening service and instead replaced it with a prayer meeting. I thought, okay, well, um, I guess I'll run with it. And so they, they sent us up into a big room. There's about 100 people there. And they scattered us throughout the room. Everybody stands about 10 or 20 feet apart from each other. And we're just supposed to stand there and pray. I thought, OK, that's a bit different, but I'll run with it, you know. So I'm doing that. And, um, and I kind of think to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> I don't know anybody. This is a little strange. But you know, as that was going on, the leader that night, he walked over to me. You know, he's just he's pretty quiet in the place. And, he's, and at one point he said, you know, I just have this sense you need to hear these words. And he says, don't look back on the, the pleasures of the old life. You know, the treasures of the old life, the pleasures of the old life, yeah, they're nice and everything, but don't focus on that. Instead, remember God is saying to you, he says this, in my presence there's fullness of joy and in my right hand are pleasures forevermore. And, you know, it was kind of what I needed to hear at that point. To be honest, I had trouble believing it because um, it just seemed to come out of the blue. 
And I didn't really know where in the Bible. I knew he was quoting the Bible, but I didn't know where exactly. But it's, again, Psalm 16. And that just illustrates sort of how the scriptures are supposed to be used. They apply to our lives. And the reason, the reason I'm sharing that story is because, again, like Luther says, these words are your words. The words of every psalm are your words. They're, they're yours. You can claim them. But I think that maybe there's certain people here today who especially need to hear these words today, that God is saying to you also, the, 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 the old pleasures, the old treasures, they're okay. But I've got new stuff coming. I've got better stuff coming. So don't focus on the old stuff as much. Remember that in my presence there's fullness of joy, and in my right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so that word is for you today. And uh, now, of course, we may, if we hear these words, we think, okay, what? What is God going to give me? And, and when is it going to happen? But the point of the psalm is it's not so much about what and when. It's about who. You're connected to the giver of all good things. That means eventually good things are going to come to you. But it's the most important thing is to maintain that connection to the giver of all good things. That's what really matters. And so the message of Palm Sunday and Easter is that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to announce that he's going to become king of this world and that's the promise given not just to others but to you. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world but that's not just a promise given to other people, that's for you, each of you personally. Jesus rose from the dead on Easter to promise that if we connect to him we too can have resurrection bodies, we too can beat death, that's a promise not just to others but for you. And at communion that we, was, we uh, was set up on the, the Last Supper, Jesus promises he can be with us. The direct connection personally, that's not just a promise given to other people, but that's for you. Not just to the person next to you, but for you, each of you. And this means you're connected to the giver of all good things. And that means even his presence is a gift as we go through life. All the joys and hopes and dreams that we have will be met in heaven for sure, but more good things are also coming here on earth. And so the message is, let's stay with Jesus in the meantime so we can experience that with him. Trust that God is good. Let's pray. Lord God, none of us are perfect. I know I'm not perfect, and no person is perfect. And so we admit that, and we ask that you forgive us our sins, cleanse each of us here, and help us take you as Savior and Lord so that we can remain in that covenant that you offer to us. Thank you, Jesus, for this. And help us take these promises you give us into ourselves, the promise of resurrection from death, the promise that you can be present with us, the promise that you have good plans for this world, not just for the next, but for this world too. Help us take these promises into our lives and help us believe also that you are present with us. We are friends with the giver of all good things. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.
continue with the confession of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen.
Please rise together. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, keeping his grace now and forever. Amen. Amen. See him in the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just stay standing. <laughs> Keep standing. One more time. Okay. I'll just do a couple quick announcements and we'll do the closing hymn. Again, welcome to our visitors. Great to have you with us today. It's been a wonderful uh, time to be together as God's risen people. Uh, the announcements are printed in the bulletin. There's lots going on. So I would encourage you to actually take this with you home. Don't leave it. Because there's lots of things going on in the church that are really exciting coming up. So please take some time to review the bulletin. The main thing is we have our annual meeting next week. Did I hear three cheers? <laughs> <laughs> and the annual reports are available on the side table. So please pick up a copy of the annual report and make sure that you read it and come for the annual meeting next Sunday following the church service. So it would be great to be together. And please pray for that annual meeting. We need to allow God to be part of our meetings as too, so take some time to pray for us as we uh, meet together. And now we're going to sing our closing hymn, Now All the Vault of Heaven. <laughs>